is Dr. Lauren Lownan from Keene State College, and this is a short video lecture on in the area of Mendelian genetics, where we're going to look at a couple of example human conditions, where those conditions are inherited according to Mendelian patterns, and we're also going to look at the use of pedigrees in solving or studying human genetic conditions. We looked at this in class already once, but we're going to look at it again. This is, um, these images show people with um, a genetic condition called oculocutaneous albinism. There are many forms of albinism. Oculocutaneous is one form, and that's what I'm addressing in this video lecture. This kind of albinism is considered a Mendelian trait, which means it is inherited in such a way that it follows the patterns typically associated with Mendelian genetics. That also always means that it is reliant on usually one single gene and two typical alleles, one fully dominant to the other. In oculocutaneous albinism, or albinism 1, it is related to um, having that condition means you have faulty tyrosinase gene or TYR genes. So you have an allele, or two alleles more accurately, that are non-functional. So they, when expressed, you get no working tyrosinase enzyme. And what does that mean? Well, in our body, in the human body, when we eat the amino acid phenylalanine, when we get it through the consumption of protein in our diet, phenylalanine gets <coughs> metabolized in the body through a degradation pathway or pathways. One of the pathways leads to the production of the neuroactive chemical DOPA, and DOPA gets converted to melanin, and melanin is what gives us the pigment in our hair, skin, nails, and eyes, and it's a really, really important pigment because it protects us from UV damage from the sun. The way that DOPA is converted to melanin is through the action of the protein enzyme tyrosinase, which is encoded by the TYR gene. If it's not working, you don't get melanin production. There are two common forms or alleles of tyrosinase uh, gene or TYR gene that are important in this story. We're going to call one the TYR-D allele and the other the TYR-H allele. The TYR-D allele is recessive to the TYR-H allele. And when you have two copies of the TYR-D allele, it means that you are albino. The TYR-H allele is dominant relative to the TYR-D. And so you only need one copy of this in order to not have albinism. So these are the three possible genotypes. Don't let the symbolism throw you off. You might be used to seeing gene symbols that are only one letter, but that's not actually the way that gene symbols are written in science today. They're generally written as the full gene name and then a superscript or an extension of some sort, as I've written these here. So this type of albinism, oculocutaneous albinism, is inherited according to Mendelian patterns. Therefore, it is a Mendelian trait. So let's ask this question. If two he people who are not albino phenotypes, so they're not albino individuals, but they are carriers for the tur allele, had a baby, what's the chance that their baby would have the albino phenotype? First, let's consider the genotypes of the parents. They're carriers, which means they're heterozygous. So they're tur D, tur H. When they produce gametes, one type of gamete will be containing tur D, the other type of gamete will be containing tur H. So that parent is the same as this parent, therefore the gametes on each axis of the Punnett square are identical. The cells of the Punnett square mimic what the possible fertilization events could be for these parents. This individual, tur D, tur D, has the two copies of the recessive disease-associated alleles, therefore they are albino. This individual that would be produced from this fertilization event is tur H, tur D. They've got one of the dominant copies, therefore it doesn't matter that they're carrying the recessive disease-associated allele, they will not be albino. This offspring would be tur D, tur H, and the order of these doesn't matter, by the way. It's 
since a cell is, is three-dimensional anyway. But they've got one uh, working dominant copy, so they'll make enough tyrosinase enzyme that they will not be albino. They're able to make plenty of, of uh, melanin. And then the homozygote for the functional dominant allele will also not be albino. So if we look at this overall, the possibility that these individuals would have a baby who has the albino phenotype is one out of four, or 25%. Often we analyze these sorts of human questions with pedigree analysis, because of course you can't do genetic experiments with humans. Instead, what you can do is get the genetic history or the health history of a set of parents in order to figure out what their possible genotypes are, what the genotypes were of their parents, and what their possible offspring genotypes might be. This is a typical human pedigree setup. The squares indicate males and the circles indicate females. The lines between them that are horizontal indicate a mating, not a marriage, just a mating. And then these are the offspring produced by parent A and parent B in this generation. So these two parents produced this individual, a boy, a boy, a girl, a girl, and another girl. And only one of their offspring, of the five offspring shown, has the condition. I know that because in this case, the symbol is filled in completely. So in a human pedigree analysis, we fill in the symbols if the individual involved has the condition that we're studying, and we leave them open or not filled in if they do not have the condition. So now this individual, this female who had albinism, had offspring with this male, and together they produced five children, three daughters, two sons. None of them had albinism. So each time they produced a baby, there was a 25% chance that they would have had an albino baby, but it seems that, you know, in each event, they, they got the other options. We don't know what the chance is, well, we do know what the chance is, but we don't know, just looking at this, what the genotypes are. We can estimate that these children, however, are carriers for albinism by looking at the previous Punnett square and going back to the, to the um, genotypes that do not give albinism, because we know that about them. And we know that two out of three of those uh, possibilities, or 66.6%, um, were carriers. So that's the chance for each of these that they're a carrier. How do we get this individual down here having albinism? Well, if you, if you work the Punnett squares, the only way this can happen, if these two people do not have albinism, both of them had to be carriers. And you should be able to work a Punnett square to prove that. So for example, here's a different pedigree. What does this pedigree suggest about the mode of inheritance? Is the genetic condition being studied autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or sex-linked. Now I've just thrown a bunch of terminology at you that you're not familiar with. Well, let's address it a little bit at a time. Autosomal means that we're tracking a gene that is on chromosomes 1 through 22. It is not associated with a sex chromosome. Sex-linked means we would be tracking a gene that is on the X, or the Y. Usually for us it means the X because the X chromosome has more genetic content than the Y. Now looking at this quickly, I can see that females, I've got three affected females, and I've got two affected males. So I'm not seeing a pattern where the only organisms or the only people affected are male or female. It's probably not a sex-linked condition. So let's hypothesize that it's an autosomal condition due to a gene that is on an autosomal chromosome. Well, is it going to be recessive or is it going to be um, dominant? And you can work the different scenarios to figure that out, but let me propose to you that this condition, which is Huntington's disease, by the way, a progressive neurological disorder that does affect people, let's hypothesize that it's dominant. And I'm going to do that because I'm seeing it in every generation. This generation, this generation, and this generation. And that's a pattern that you often see with dominant conditions. So let's just say, here we'll go back up here for a minute, let's just say that in this scenario, this individual 
is little h, little h, and this individual is big H, little h. And then this proposal, this what we're hypothesizing is big H is associated with disease and is dominant to little h. So I'm saying, let, let's say H, big H, is for the disease-associated allele, and it's dominant. Little h is for the non-disease associated allele and it's recessive. So in other words, most people in our populations are little h, little h, and that's actually true. So let's say that we've got somebody with uh, Huntington's disease and they have this phenotype, or the, sorry, this, they were big h, little h, they produced this gamete and this gamete. Then we had a healthy individual that did not carry the disease associated allele we know that because they do not have Huntington's. That's the dad. He produces gametes little h or little h. These are the possible fertilization events that they could uh, undergo with the gametes from the male or the female parent. And these are the possible, possible outcomes, the genotypes and the phenotypes. And we've got two, two out of four have Huntington's disease and two out of four do not have Huntington's disease. And when I go back and I look at that pedigree, this family produced one, two, three offspring, and two thirds of them had the disease. And that really fits with um, the pattern of autosomal dominant inheritance. So probably that's correct. In fact, it is correct. So with that, I conclude this short lecture and the about um, a couple of examples of human genetic disease and the use of pedigree analysis and also what the term Mendelian trait means.